one of my favorite tunes from my homeland. And I want to thank my fellow Irishman and good friend Ian Patrick Knight for sharing his wonderful talents with us. I am very partial to the words from my homeland, of course, and you shall be seeing many of them on the screen today, along with photos that will help me to tell my story. And so to begin, I want to say, Cade mi lafapta an That's a traditional Irish Gaelic greeting, which means a hundred thousand welcomes. How are you? Now, as you know, my name is Teresa Catherine McCambridge Sweet. Now, I know my middle name came from my dad's elder sister, but I don't know exactly why my parents decided to name me Teresa. But I know in Irish Gaelic it means strength, and in Greek it means harvester. So perhaps I was ordained to do great things, to be strong, to work hard, and to serve the Lord. Now, sometimes over the years, I have known that people have added an H to my name. And I'm always quick to remove it, because that would mean it was French, and I'm definitely not French. <laughs> now mind you, families of Irish descent were not very common in Gig Harbor when I was in Gig Harbor, and there was that one family, the Maloney's, that you'll be able to read about in the display case in the lobby. But before I get to my life story, I think you should know a little bit about what was going on in Ireland. So I have one of my books, History of Ireland, and I was just going to read just a little bit in it. As you know, Irish history is marked with co conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics. In the late 18th century, Irish Catholics became determined to overthrow British rule. This activity culminated in the Irish Rebellion of 1798. They eventually were emancipated, but sporadic skirmishes did continue. Now during this time, most of the farmland was owned by those English landlords, and they didn't care much for the land or the people who were living there. And most of them could not even raise enough food to feed their families. Why, one English Duke of Wellington even said, and I quote, there never was a country in which such poverty existed to the extent that it does in Ireland, unquote. Now, a second problem was the fact that the annual harvest was based mostly on the potato. Now, a good harvest meant high yield with minimal care. But unfortunately, the potato was susceptible to disease, and famines often occurred when a crop failed. Indeed, the Great Famine of 1845-50 to 50 led to mass starvation and immigration, and the population of Ireland dropped by over 25%. Well, by the late 19th century, the country saw major land reform, and many of those landowners were able to purchase their lands. But there were still differences between the Protestant Orange Order and the Catholic Ancient Order. Even after the Irish War of Independence in 1922, most of Ireland did break away from the United Kingdom, but the conflict still continued. Now, my family was Catholic, and Though we did try to get along with those Protestants, it was not all that easy. <laughs> well, so now, back to me and my family. I was born in Cushnell County, Antrim, Northern Ireland, on August 10, 1873, and my parents were James and Mary Connolly, Connolly McCambridge. I was baptized on July 10th of the same year in the Church of the Blessed Virgin near my home. Now, we were a large family, my mom and dad, my seven sisters, and my only brother, John. And we were quite well to do by the standards of the day. We had a lovely home on Le Colbany Farm, which had been in our family for over 200 years, and where many of our family members were born. Now, I attended public schools, and I completed the fourth year of high school, and my parents even afforded to send me to England for some additional schooling. I, I have such fond memories of my homeland, the cities, the Giant's Causeway, Dunluce Castle, I and the Glens, the beautiful countryside, and the Irish music and dancing. Oh, how I love the dancing.
first moving sidewalk and a midway with the very first ever Ferris wheel. And I'm telling you, it was 264 feet high and it took 20 minutes to make two revolutions. Well, I told you I was a bit adventuresome, so I stood there and watched it for some time and finally got up my nerve and had to pay another 50 cents. And I got on. Oh, my heart was just a pounding in my chest. Then it was so exhilarating when I got up so high and I could look all out and see all of Chicago beneath me. Well, now, I'm sure you'll be wondering how I happened to meet me James. We never knew each other in our homeland. James Sweeney was born in Derry, London, Derry County, Northern Ireland in 1864. And his parents were James and Jane Quigley Sweeney. He was baptized later that year in the Columbus Church Long Tower. Now, Derry is the only remaining intact walled city in Ireland, and those walls were built in the 1600s to try to keep out the English and Scottish settlers. Given the historical perspective of the time, as I was telling you, it wasn't too hard to figure out why a young man would leave Ireland. And that's what James did on October 23, 1885. And when he got to Chicago, he started selling spirits in a mercantile. And he also worked for the railroads as a switchman, where he would go to the yards and the terminals and make sure that the cars stayed on the correct tracks. Actually, James and I both worked in stores because that seemed to be where the best employment opportunities were. So I just think it was the luck of the Irish that we both happened to be there in Chicago and chance to meet. You know, we Irish immigrants did stick pretty close together because of that anti-Irish sentiment I was telling you about. Why, do you know, even in the Chicago Tribune, they often dismissed us as lazy and shiftless? Oh, and as I recall, it was during this time that sometimes I even dropped the MC prefix on my name, and I just went by Teresa Cambridge so that I might better blend in. Well. It just seemed that there was always something going on, and we did have us some grand times. We would have Kayleys where we would dance in the town halls or in the countryside, and we might even have a little beer. <laughs>
Well, I think you can see what fun we would have with those dancers. That's what I met with James. Uh, what a handsome one he was. He was 5 feet 11 inches tall, about 165 pounds and quite fit. And he had these crystal blue eyes that always held a wee bit of a twinkle and dark ginger hair that he tried to keep hidden under his cap so he wouldn't stand out so much. You know, he showed quite a bit of interest in me from that very first time, and it was not long for he was a court to me something fierce. <laughs> and you know, he didn't wait long to propose either, because we were married less than a year later in Kinsman, Illinois, on June 26, 1894. Now, there wasn't much fanfare for us about that wedding. We just went to the city hall. And James even filled out all the paperwork, even signed a new name. Now, <laughs> I was not too happy about that, but I was trying to be a beautiful wife right off the bat, so I didn't protest. Now, we made our first home in Chicago, and I even remember the address, 4133 Wentworth Avenue. You know, we started our family there, too. And in all, we had six children. Although our son Daniel, who was born in 1907, died after just a few days, and we did have a stillborn daughter in 1910. You know, losing those children was very hard, but I didn't have a lot of time to mourn because I was the mother of four very busy sons. James Joseph, born in 1897, Patrick Francis, whom we always call Frank, 1900, John Edward, born in 1903, Henry Leo, born in 1904. Now, we tried to make a good life in Chicago, but it was difficult. And it was about this time that my sister Rosetta contacted me and told me about a place where she was living on the west coast of the United States. With our 16-year age difference, she had left home when I was younger, and she married a man named Hugh McGavick. In America, they had moved around some, and then they were on the train bound for San Francisco when they stopped in the coal mine, a man that offered you a job. So they got off, and they ended up in Gibb Harbor and bought land in Rosedale. And Leo, their son, who was born a short time later, became a prominent attorney in Tacoma. Well, Rosetta and you kept talking about this place on the West Coast and finally convinced us to come, which we did in 1908. And they helped us buy land there in Rosedale, too, about 40 acres, as I recall. I don't remember exactly what the property cost us, but Faith and Bagora, we were able to purchase it without a mortgage. We cleared the land and built a very nice home with electricity and plumbing, and then we started a farm there where we grew mostly berries and vegetables. Now, James also wanted to try his hand with some animals, so we had some turkeys. But that did not go so well, and all the turkeys died. So we never had any other animals on the farm except for the family dogs. Well, and although James was a farmer, he always applied and got a job in 1910 with the Northern Pacific Railway, and he worked that job for two years until he resigned. I never knew why he resigned. And I suppose at this time I should also tell you that before I knew him, he was shot in the head. <laughs> now, I never knew what happened or where that was, but I often wondered if that had somehow changed him. And you know, my grandson Bill told me sometime later that he remembered a scar on his grandfather's head, but he never asked him about it. <laughs> well, as you might know, our Catholic faith was very important to us, and we were faithful churchgoers on Sundays and well-dressed the men in their suits and ties, and I in my dresses, hats, and gloves. The first communions of my children were always very important to my family. You know, I was a trustee of that St. Nicholas Catholic Church, and I was instrumental in the fundraising to build the very first building. And I was a member of the Altar Society. What a proud moment for me it was when in later years I heard that someone said I was, and I quote, a zealous Catholic who gave time, money, and effort toward the little Catholic parish and acted for Catholic progress in the little harbor city, working unceasingly for the good of friends and neighbors and the whole community. Those were very nice words, do you not think? 
Well, we all worked diligently on the ranch and I was thankful to have four strong sons. You know, James was a very hard worker and he also tried to keep up on all the news of the day, reading the papers cover to cover and listening to his shortwave radio. He had a keen interest in everything, especially politics, even though it was I who later entered into them. You know, nature, especially birds. And he knew the names of every plant and what it could be used for, especially if it had medicinal purposes. You know, he loved his books. He had the ones from the Everyman Library series, and he always seemed to refer to this one, How to Keep Well. His woodworking skills were well known as well, and he built benches all around the property just so he could sit and enjoy nature. Well, I guess we all thought life would pretty much just continue on as it was. But in 1915, a fire destroyed our home, and life changed significantly for us. We couldn't afford to rebuild the house, so James tried to turn the barn into a living residence. But it was really more of just a shed, and there were rough times in that barn house, and well, I just decided that I couldn't stay. When I made my decision and I told James that I was going to go, he just said, I'm staying. And well, that was the end of that. <laughs> I was restless, and with the education, drive, and business sense, I just, I knew it was a difficult decision, but I had to go. My mother, rest her soul, always told me to go after what I wanted. And it just seemed to me that the women were a bit stronger than the men. <laughs> but it was a sad turn of events and something that I shall not speak about anymore. Now my boys came with me to town because I wanted them to be educated properly and learn to read and write. And it was just too long a walk back and forth from the farm. Now they did always take food and wine for their father though on the farm, and they sometimes bring him the beer too. Now as you might surmise, he was a wee bit of a drinker, but he was remembered by his grandchildren as a grandfather who loved them dearly and loved spending time with them. You know, they said he always kept that house immaculate with a place for everything. And they said he was a very good cook and that he was meticulous about doing his laundry. He always stayed very slim, and he sported quite a mustache and wore his wire rim glasses for reading. Over the years, we did gather from time to time on the ranch and at the neighbors' houses for gatherings, but later on, as we aged, I became more concerned about James, and I would often send my grandson Leo to spend time with them on the ranch. Well, back to what I was doing. I got to town in 1915, and I bought some property at the head of Big Harbor Bay, and I built a home out of which I operated a small store, a real estate office, and a post office. Soon after, I was appointed postmistress by Democratic President Woodrow Wilson, and I served for seven years until Republican President Harding was elected in 1921. Now, as someone once wrote about me in the local paper, quote, the court seemed to be in a bit of disarray, so Teresa was right on the job and ready to dish out liberal doses of justice to those brought before her in the fractions of the law. I tried to make sure everyone was recognized and did what they were supposed to do. I also became a notary public for the state of Washington in 1929, and folks needing that service were often surprised that T.C. Sweeney was a woman. You know, I still have the notary stamp embosser. And so, today, I made you a bookmark with my notary stamp on it and an Irish blessing, and you'll be able to pick them up later. I thought you might like them a bit to up today. Well, now, worldly possessions were not my main goal, but I did have a few prized things. My lead crystal bowl was a cherished piece. And perhaps my favorite thing, was me the pewter teapot that I always kept right on the wood stove with water in case someone decided to come by for a cup of tea. You know, my son John lived with me, and even after I was gone, he would leave it on the stove and do his morning coffee. 
Now, over the years, it developed a little hole in the bottom. So John plugged it up with some string, and it became hard to cement, effectively plugging up the hole. Now, in later years, when my grandson Leo's family got it, they accidentally pulled out the string, and they can never get it back. <laughs> now, mind you, a woman in business was not a common thing in Gig Harbor. Other women I knew were employed in <coughs> occupations that were acceptable for a woman, like teaching and nursing. And even though women were finally allowed to vote in 1920, it seemed like inequities kept going on between men and women. But oh, that's another story. <laughs> now at this time, I think I also worked hard to lose the Irish accent. Indeed. My, my grandchildren say that they don't, don't remember much of an accent. So I think it just faded with time and a little effort on my part. <laughs> As business improved, I wanted to expand. So in 1922, I bought property across the street from my house and I started a small berry station. Later, putting up a building that was called the Sweeney Building, the Sweeney Block, or as some folks even called it, Gig Harbor's first strip mall. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad at this time that I could provide jobs for many local people. Now I moved my store to that new building, and I operated a mercantile out of there with a $15,000 inventory. Now being a woman in a man's world, I often felt that it was more prudent to just list me name as T.C. Sweeney, so folks didn't automatically know my gender. My building was called T.C. Sweeney and Sons, so people knew it was a family business and that there were men involved. And what kept me motivated was an old Irish saying, there are only three kinds of men that don't understand women, young men, old men, and men of middle age. <laughs> I get all the women laughing, not so many <laughs> Well, trying to be an astute business person, I rented out parts of the building for a new post office, a restaurant later called the Home Cafe, a dental office for Dr. Harold Ryan, who later became the city's first mayor, Baldwin Shoe Shop, Allen's Drugstore, and Humbley's Barbershop. And as just another little aside, recently I was doing a presentation about the waterfront walking tours here at Big Harbor. And someone in the audience said, asked me if my barbershops were anything like that barbershop of that Sweeney tar of <laughs> <laughs> literary thing. Well, it seems in his barbershop, when someone sat in the barber chair, he would pull a lever and they would fall through the floor down into the basement where unspeakable things would happen. <laughs> well, I can assure you there was no such thing in my barbershop. <laughs> now, it was during all these years of business that my grandson spent a great deal of time with me at the store. And they'd get their exercise walking back and forth to the ranch. They would spend hours on the docks watching the boats come and go and fishing off those docks. And they played in the horseshoe pit. And they even told me they remember the local businessmen coming to play horseshoes at their lunch hours. And I love this story. My granddaughter, Teresa, told me that one time she was at the ranch trying to keep up with the boys and she burned her hand on the wood stove. I was very angry at James for letting that happen, but the boys scooped her up and took her to town to catch the ferry to Tacoma for medical help. Well, as the story goes, the ferry had already left the dock, but Teresa was screaming so loud <laughs> that the ferry turned around. <laughs> now, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's the story that stands, and those boys did know their way around the docks and the town. Well, years later, the first library was there adjacent to my house, and Miss Lucy Goodman ran her kindergarten right next door, and the students would come to my house to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Whenever my grandsons would come to town, they'd go to Miss Lucy's kindergarten too, sometimes for more than one year, even though they don't even think they were ever enrolled. <laughs> now that's Miss Lucy right there, beckoning on some of those kindergartners and her famous car parked in front. Now from this property, I helped to build the district in many ways. I gave credit in my store to poultry raisers, 
I ship berries, Christmas trees, and greens, and I help provide adequate transportation to Tacoma. And it always amused me that folks took to speculate how a woman could afford this property and to run these businesses. But as you know, a proper woman never tells her secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, many businesses found their home in my building until it was finally demolished in 1967. And the lot where it stood was vacant until 2015 when they built that outdoor seating area for that Anthony's restaurant. And right there, there's a historical marker that actually tells about me and my building, which means I did have a place in shape and big heart. Well, as you know, and you can see, my greatest interest was the business development of the town, but I was also pretty active in community affairs as well, although I wonder how I ever had the time. I was the president of the Fair Association, and I was known to consistently stand up for good schools and improved roads, something I think you can help with today. I was also in the Brotherhood of American Yeomen, the Women's Voters League, first secretary of the Peninsula Federated Clubs, and vice president of the PTA. And I also worked with C.E. Shaw to promote activities that would bring people to Big Harbor, including the rooster races and weekend carnivals. <laughs> and in the Pierce County Democratic Club, I was the precinct committee woman. And in 1926, I actually ran for the legislature. But at that time, Pierce County was a Republican stronghold, so I was defeated. But I ran a good, solid race. <laughs> now, by then, my sons were well established. James was a carpenter, and he worked for the Canadian Pacific Railway, but he often helped out at the farm and he brought berries to my store. He married May Helena Hurley in 1923 at St. Leo's Catholic Church in Tacoma, and they raised nine children, although two died quite young. Now, several of their sons would come and help out in the store from time to time, and I remember especially David, who would take and deliver groceries to places within walking distance, and he thought his payment of milk and cookies was the best. <laughs> James died in Olympia in 1955. Frank married a woman named Clara in 1936, and they moved to California. They had five children, and he lived till 1976. Leo was a priest, and oh, what a status symbol in the Catholic community to have a priest in your family. I just always wish my parents could have known. He passed away from heart disease in Utah in 1959. Now, John never married. He eventually worked at the shipyards in Bremerton, and he passed away in 1981. He was such a kind soul, and he always helped out everyone, especially the little old ladies in town. He would drive them wherever they wanted to go, even though he was not known to be a very good driver. And he had a <laughs> dislike for stop signs. <laughs> but he did his best to help, bless his soul, and he stayed with me to the end. My grandsons, Jim, Tim, and Bill, remember him as such a kind and gentle man. But he was able to hand out discipline when some unruly house high school boys would come to the store. Mm -hmm. When my grandsons had come to town, John would also often take them to the barber shop. And the barber would put a clothes sign up on the door and give them all haircuts. Mm -hmm. And those boys remembered that their brother, Leo, always seemed to be in trouble with Uncle John. <laughs> he would steal his hats and his cigars. And I have to say, Leo was a scrappy one. Why, in church, sometimes he would even hold up the bulletin. <laughs> well, one time on the ranch, the boys were digging holes and they were building steps. And Uncle John was out there carrying the wood and he tripped and fell and he was so angry he said, Those boys should go without supper. But I said, I, they be good boys. And I fed them anyway. The end of my life was difficult because I suffered a broken hip and it plagued me for some time making it necessary for me to walk with this cane. Now my grandchildren say that while I needed the cane to steady myself, I used it more to get their attention. And if I banged it on the floor, they better listen. <laughs> now, I didn't deal well with being largely physically incapacitated. My mind and desires were still strong, but the physical weakness was hard for me to accept. And as good as my son John was to me, in all those years, bless his soul, at the end of my life, I didn't much like that I was kind of dependent on a man. Although we lived apart, my marriage to James did survive the years. 
I passed away rather unexpectedly at St. Joseph's Hospital in 1941. Services were held at that St. Leo's Church in Tacoma, where my son, Leo, did the Catholic Mass of burial, and the Reverend Holen from St. Nicholas Catholic Church delivered the sermon. My burial followed in Calvary Cemetery in Tacoma, where James joined me in 1951. And you know, he died on that ranch that he loved so much. It happened one day when our son James and they were there. They were helping to chop wood, and James just sat down on one of those benches that he loved, slumped over, and passed away. You know, it seemed to me somehow fitting that he lived and died on that farm that held his heart. Eventually, James, May, and John joined us in Calvary Cemetery. Henry Leo was buried in Utah, and Frank was buried with his wife Clara in California. In later years, as I sat in my rocking chair and listened to the music on my Victrola, contemplated all that had happened, and I can tell you I had a good life. A few of my possessions do remain, and you'll be able to see some of them over there on the table afterward, and that table's covered in one of my prized Irish tablecloths. There's a photo of my house there. There's a painting of that barn house, and I can tell you the frame is made of wood from that house. And there's a painting right there in the center of my building. It's one of my most prized possessions. <coughs> Pretty fine looking place, if I do say so myself. <laughs> but as for me, it was never about possessions or wealth, so much as it was about what was doing the best that I could for my family, my church, my community. My grandchildren say that they thought it was my greatest joy to bring people to Gig Harbor and help them succeed. And so, the timeline of my life, the names, the dates, the places, it's important history to be sure, but it only tells part of the story. I hope that I have left a wee bit of a legacy here in my beloved Gig Harbor. Indeed, my family even commemorated those contributions with bricks at the Finn Home View Climb. And I think it's most fitting that those are there because it has a remarkable view of the places where my building used to be and the mountain and the harbor that I so dearly love. So finally, I hope that because of me, there is a wee bit of kindness toward the Irish for, be they kings or poets or farmers, they're a people of great worth. They keep company with the angels and bring a bit of heaven on earth. Erin go